Okay, I want to talk to you um, about heroes. Um, yeah, about whistleblowers, which are heroes. And I guess everybody likes whistleblowers. So I never met anyone who said, oh, I don't like them. So and I thought about why do we like whistleblowers? And I guess one thing is um, they do good things. The other thing is maybe we like them so much because we don't know, because the most whistleblowers we will never see and we will never hear of. Um, reason is um, if you blow a whistle, um, it's most mostly it's a silent process, which seems a bit strange because the whistle is loud, but it is. In fact, if you take the daily newspaper and you look inside a news, something happened in this or that company or this or that government has done this or this thing, um, you can guess that anybody leaked an information in about more than 80%. So there are much more whistleblowers out there than you would think. That's why I put this sentence from the Begas Opera to start with. So um, we love whistleblowers because um, we love people um, who really live for their ethical ideas without taking care of what this means to them. We call that idealism. It's a philosophical term. And we got, for that idealism, we have an icon, I guess, which is this. So everybody thinks of doing things without caring for personal matters. This is the person who lived that for us. But we have whistleblower heroes too. Lots of them. This is, I guess, the nowadays most famous one, and I love that picture, and I love that bus. We have two views of this. Oops, sorry. Ah, okay. So why are whistleblowers active? I think we could make the list much longer. Um, lots of evil things are happening out there, and um, the most things we see are related to freedom of information. I guess most people in this audience is what they are uh, concerned about when the whistle is blown, and surveillance. Um, you know that? Um, if Everybody has uh, heard about these NSA papers uh, that the... Um, uh, even the guys from the parliament are not allowed to see, so um, could be better, could be worse, for sure. If you look at these guys, okay. <laughs> okay, so I was, um, last weekend I was in Istanbul, in, in Turkey, and this is one case where information freedom is uh, really threaded. Uh, I think this is a funny thing, this is from the German Bild Zeitung, a right-wing newspaper, um, which brings me to that freedom is always the freedom of others, they might think, in fact, is this of dissenters. So these people there um, are fighting for being heard and attacking for freedom of information is just a starter. Who attacks freedom of information? Whoa. Who attacks freedom of information attacks usually other things in our freedom too. This is Taksimplatz, the um, demonstrators last um, uh, protesters yeah, this weekend couldn't make it there because of the massive presence of police. So, the Whistleblowers Hall of Fame, my, in my belief, we... Um, sorry, I have to interrupt because they have loudspeakers there. I don't have loudspeaker here, which makes it extremely... Uh, hard to talk because I cannot hear myself. Okay, I want to talk about whistleblowers because I think we forget too fast. We are living in a stream of events. Sorry. Okay, so does anybody have, have ever seen this book? This is from the 70s. And it's written from the, by that man. Philip Bejim, 1969. And what he did is he was one of the first um, really famous whistleblowers. He leaked a thing which happened um, where now people, politicians, um, especially Angela Merkel, got angry about that. This was the CIA spied 
NATO partners in the early or in the late 60s. And he wrote this book about, the funny thing about this book is I tried to get the book, he had to buy it, you cannot buy it anywhere, it's just antiquarian, and I got one offer to buy it worldwide, and that offer was $250 for, there are only, I guess there are 10 of these books left in this world. So if anybody gets notice of one of these books, I'm interested. Okay. You know, these guys, this way and spoke to that man, that famous sentence, I guess, well, maybe, okay, I'm from the older ones in that audience here, but okay, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, um, let's put this son of a bail, it's, it's um, a citi citation which is about this man. I guess most of them, or at least some of them should know him, this is Danny Ellsberg. And what he did was, just, does anybody know? It's the, um, the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers contained massive information about war crime um, the um, United States committed in Vietnam. And that was the reason why Nixon was so angry about that man, because that all, this all came out. This man in the middle is Perry Falwick, 1972. Inspired by Danny Ellsberg, he got, went out to the public, and this is the first NSA whistleblower, as we know. So he published, but what he said so many years ago, 40 years ago, nobody really believed him in the beginning, because people said, this cannot be possible. There is an office in the United States which has double the money than the CIA. Nobody had ever heard of that, the NSA. And he brought that all to public. The funny thing is many things, when people say, whoa, this has happened, when they read about things Snowden leaked, um, we know since 40 years, we forgot. Deep throat, now, um, Okay, I attend hacker conferences and hacker conferences. You always have, um, it's a good practice to bring some porn into your um, lecture. Deep Throat is, was the name of a porn in the 70s. And it was also the, the name, the nickname of that guy when he leaked information. Do you know him? Mark Feld. Mark Feld was the, um, the vice president of the um, of CIA, so highly ranked, and he leaked Watergate. And the two, um, the two reporters from Washington Post promised him that they would never leak his identity, and they kept their promise for almost 30 years, and close to his death, then he said that he was it, it was him. So nobody knows, so it was very high. I think, um, as I said in the beginning, they're not so well known, one at least in this country, this woman is from Israel. She leaked police corruption, which led for her that they um, uh, tried to make the process to um, declare her mentally ill, uh, which ended in um, really stress for her, but after, I think, 10 years, um, she got massive, um, uh, um, compensation for that and she made a foundation for whistleblowers which is called Ogin in Israel and this is about police corruption I think police corruption is really an issue okay this is um, funny thing it's um, 155 millimeter uh, gun you can really make really really big holes and this is Herbert Amri and I fear that nobody has ever heard of him. Does anybody have ever heard of that guy? No. Okay. He was the ambassador of Austria in Athens, in Greece, 1984. And what he found out was that illicit arm trades of Austrian guns, which were delivered, to, guess who? Yes, Zedan. Here he's together with the, four, with the at that time prince of Kuwait. He's smiling because he thinks I'm going to your country right now with that guns. <laughs> okay, later he had not so much fun. 
Saddam got 200 of these guns, and the crazy thing is, Iran got 140 of these guns too, in the Gulf War. So Austrian war, um, yeah, war goods manufacturers delivered both sides. Herbert Henry brought that to the, try to bring that to the public, but, but, but the mistake he made said, oh, this cannot happen, I have to inform the government. This was really the mistake he made, which led to that. And if you look at that date here, oops, 1984. Guess how long he survived his call to the Austrian government? Six days. Six days later, he was dead. Yeah, it was a um, heart attack, sure. He had a party and then went to bed and had a heart attack. He was never ill before, and they burned his body immediately. <laughs> So, six days for that. It's a shame that he's forgotten. It's, I think that's a, one of the heroes we, where we, we lost the remembrance. So, Ketan Bokovac. Anybody know her? When peacekeepers in Bosnia were involved in sex trafficking. In fact, the peace troops were there to prevent that. And she had to see that her comrades took part in that. So they, they got money, they got sex, they got everything. Um, there was a film made on that, which is called um, The Whistleblower. And um, there are some films about, uh, where, which um, rely on the story of real whistleblowers. And if you look a bit deeper into the history, you will find lots of interesting story. I think um, the story of Herbert Amri is worth a Bond movie. Know that man? He brought out that, um, yeah, that uh, uh, disabled people were used to test drugs. And, yeah, which uh, resulted in, I think, the biggest uh, um, Sioux, uh, a pharma company um, had, they had, I think FITSA had to pay hundreds of million dollars for that. This man bought out. He was a three-time whistleblower. And um, the interesting thing is, uh, does anybody know what that is? Ketam? Okay, Ketam is a part of a whistleblower law which exists in the United States. Which means that if you whistleblow something where the United Govern States government or governmental body is, um, is betrayed, you can get, I think, up to 30% of the money they regain by your whistleblowing. It's a business model. It has, and it's not only a business model, the, the laws they have in the United States for whistleblowers protect them in these cases. They don't protect them if you do the right thing, like Edward Snowden, but they protect you in these cases, at least. Not only by giving you money. This is Russ Tice. This is the thing we have seen um, in, with the um, thing Edward Snowden brought out. This was, I was in the United States at that time, it was really quiet. Nobody was really interested in, until they found out that Americans were affected. And this happened 2005, and people had forgot, we all had forgot that this happened before. He brought out that um, I think AT&T delivered millions of, of, um, of records, uh, phone calls, every day at that time. So almost 10 years ago, nobody remembers. This man, cool, made a cool, made up a cool sentence. Does anybody know? Apocalypse now meets shining. That is what he said um, about Abu Ghraib. He was there, he really knows. His name was Samuel Province, and he was a whistleblower by, who um, confessed what happened there. Awful things. Okay, I got an example here from Germany. This really nice looking man, I think, was at one time one of the most hated guys in nuclear industry. He worked in a nuclear research project, 
his name is Rainer Moormann, and published that, oops, that the special kind of reactor they tried to build there would never work. Never, never, ever. It was just not possible. And it took him 30 years to bring this out. So this man was definitely right. He published and he got really, really ugly problems with, with that. But in the end, they had to take him back. They apologized. At least the science community did. So they were a bit better than um, the industry. And um, worldwide, this technology was stopped, which had an impact really of several billions for nuclear industry. Okay, do you know this girl? That's Chelsea Manning. We cannot talk about whistleblowing without mentioning her. She got 35 years. Um, we shouldn't forget. Yeah, and that was Snowden for sure. We don't know what will happen to him. So I think his um, asylum ends in August. I think it will be prolonged, but... Yeah, and I think um, he's the reason why many people are now again interested in whistleblowing. But what will it be in two years or maybe three? Then we will have forgot. One thing I wanted to bring from this thing, because I like it so much from the um, Snowden documents, this is, um, we had, uh, in the beginning, I, sh I showed you pictures from Taksim Place in, in Istanbul, where people, are, um, where protesters are there, and Erdogan locks Twitter and YouTube. In fact, Google, this is how Google works with NSA, and this is so funny here, I don't know whether you can read that. SSL, added and removed here, Traffic in clear text here, hooray. So, and this is one of 1.7 million documents. So, the question here, or traitor, is rhetorical. Um, but if we go outside, I think if we would ask here, is anybody here who thinks that a whistleblower is a traitor and has the balls to stand up and say no? <laughs> okay. Um, no, honestly, um, in our context, it's clear. But if you go to the outside, to other people who are not so involved, for example, in information freedom or political or other activism, Quinnipiac University made <clears throat> a poll with 2,000 voters. They made it directly before the election, so it's kind of representative. Okay, so... Only 33% think in 2003, in last summer, that a whistleblower is a traitor. 55% is, thinks he's a hero, and about 10% are well, whistleblower, who would? Uh, no idea. Okay. Yeah, I like that, because this comes close to the idea which I think um, we need to remember. I think. Um, the World Wide Web is a great place. We find many things, not everything. If we do, especially if you do research about whistleblowing, you will see what you don't find. But um, we need places to go, we need things to touch, we need things to feel, to remember. And this is physical, and that's the reason why it works. It works better than a banner on a web page, and it gets to the people. If you go on the motorway, people pass there when they go to or from work, see that. My thesis is heroes needs monuments, and there is no whistleblower monument. So why not make one? This is what I think about that. So, what I did was, when I made this, prepared this, this talk, I came to the conclusion we need that, that it doesn't make sense to talk about the history of whistleblowing. I have give you, you, you can download my talk, you will find, I think, 70 or 80 uh, links, pictures and anything else to go into, dig into deeper and to remember maybe or find new things you don't know. But this won't take long enough or won't stay long enough in our brains. So we need a monument. So, <clears throat> Yes, freedom is always the freedom of dissenters and people 
who don't have a, we cannot memorize are getting forgot. So we need monuments like we have a monument for, we need a monument, have one for her, which is uh, um, everybody who has seen the place where she was killed here in Berlin, to fighting for her rights, will fall a shame. We need a better thing for us with whistleblowers. To make that real, um, I put that website on. If you're interested in, just post your email there, get there. The first thing I want to know is, do you need that? And if you think with me that it would be a good place, maybe here in Berlin, to have a large stone erected, we could on uh, plaquettes of name of whistleblowers, QR codes telling the stories about them, go there, find it, feel it, hang around there, meet people. So if you know a place where we can do that, and if you think it's a thing we should do, come to me, mail me, tell me. I made a little survey on Shitting Googled where you can post where you think this should happen. If enough of you think this should happen, it will happen. Thank you.